All righty. All right, good, good morning, everybody. I'd like to inform everyone that Sean Driscoll, the authority's communication director, is making an audio and video recording of today's meeting. Is there anyone else making an audio recording of today's meeting? If so, please identify yourself. If you are joining virtually, please press the raise your hand icon on the Zoom dashboard, or if you're joining by phone, by pressing star nine on your keypad. And when you are recognized, please state your name for the record. Devin. Devin Ankeny, Thomas Enterprise. Thank you. Jason. Good morning, everyone. Jason Grazia today, Nantucket Current. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. There we go. Oak Bluff, yes. Yeah. Oak Bluff Association. Yes. Hello, yeah. Billy Jean Sullivan. I'm sorry. Could you say that again? You cut out. Sure. Billy Jean Sullivan, Executive Director of the Oak Bluff Association. Thank you. And one more. Deb, Deb Shores. Deb, you're muted. Sorry about that. Deb Shores, Cape Cod RTA. Thank you. That's all I see. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is regarding remote participation pursuant to Section 20 of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 as amended. Court council members are participating remotely in today's meeting because their physical attendances today would be unreasonably difficult. All port council members in attendance and all members participating in the meeting by the Zoom video conferencing app will be clearly audible to each other. As a result of members' remote participation in this meeting, any and all votes taken by the members today shall be by roll call vote. So why don't we call the meeting to order? And uh, do I hear a motion to uh, accept the minutes of the August meeting? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, let's do a roll call. Nat? Aye. Joe? Aye. Eric? Aye. Gordon? Aye. aye. John? Aye. Munir, aye. Thank you. Let's go to the uh, the reports from management. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, sorry for the last minute change to our virtual. We have a we're dealing with a little septic issue in our conference room. So, um, so in the room here, uh, in addition to myself, is James Ashley, Mark Rosam. Uh, Allison Fletcher, Mark Higgins, Janice Kennepick, Sean Driscoll, and Terrence Keneally. Um, and down in the Gulf, hopefully uh, buttoning up the hatches for uh, the uh, weather event that's heading heading his way is um, Mark Anderson. So, Mark? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So to start off, and I'll get into the effect of the hurricane on how, but we'll get into that as we get into the projects. Start off the Aquina project. The Aquina is uh, right now, it's uh, Case um, Pierce side, right, at, right forward next to the uh, Barnstable. Next slide. We have completed the installation of the new uh, rescue boat Davit on the forecastle deck. Next slide. This is part of a new uh, engine room entrance as a result of um, having to re reshuffle a few things for clear access getting into the engine room and bow thruster areas. Next slide. And we've done the blasting and get the first primer code on all the surfaces, uh, the deck surfaces. And this is the bow area of the, uh, of the Aquina. Next slide. So with the uh, upcoming milestones for the Aquina, we're looking uh, for the incline stability test in the first week of October. Engine starts the 10th of October. Mechanical accommodations completion 15 October. 
Doc trials 18 October, C trials 22, Coast Guard C trials 24 October, and then we'll be looking at a departure date sometime thereafter. Um, maybe we can go through all the projects and come back for questions at the very end, because they're all very interlinked. Uh, our next project is the uh, Barnstable. She's a uh, peer side. This is the new uh, automation system that we have installed on board. Next slide. We've also had to put in as a result of subchapter H, a new emergency uh, steering system. This is located in the steering gear room. Next slide. So the upcoming milestones we have uh, for the for the uh, Barnstable, the power ups complete, engine starts, mechanical accommodation uh, complete, incline stability test complete. Um, we've received the light ship, um, the light ship weights from uh, U.S. Coast Guard Marine Safety Center, and we're working on all the load cases. Um, our SSA C trial is scheduled for the 10th of September, and the Coast Guard C trial we're pending. Uh, is the 19th and then we'll be discussing a departure date now um, the vessel is complete we're doing commissioning testing and uh, for coast guard and also for various testing for the new equipment that's been installed one of the issues that we have um, although the um, hurricane francine is going to be hitting louisiana over the next two days one downside that does affect us is all of our prime contractors are from Louisiana. So those are steering gear controls, engine controls, automation controls, switchboard controls, and that's part of our testing procedure. Um, they've, we do not have any of uh, those contractors on site. They've gone home for obvious reasons, and um, we, we don't know the effect of of that until after the hurricane passes here. But uh, we are, the vessel's complete. We're ready for the testing uh, and sea trial part of the uh, Barnstable. Okay, maybe let's move on to the Monomoy. And one of the positive things, uh, we got the Monomoy out of there, out of, out of Homa, and now she's in route and she's up on the hard at uh, Alabama Shipyard. Next slide, please. Um, on arrival, this is her on arrival on the uh, 9th of August. Next slide. Um, so the uh, departure, um, if it was on the 7th of August, arrival on the 9th, it was 258 nautical miles, and she came over at 4.9 knots. Next slide. This is, uh, they, they put her on the Alabama dry dock and then transferred on onto the barge. This is the barge en route to the uh, to the uh, land side. Next slide. So she came off on the uh, using the uh, SPMTs, the self-propelled modular transports, and she is on the hard now, and they are actively uh, working on her. Next, so for the Monomoy timeline, she arrived on the 9th, docked on the 20th, and she started commencing project of cleaning gas spring of all the tanks in preparation for hot work. So going to the financial uh, um, timeline here. So the three projects, um, we have 13.7 million for the Barnstable and the Aquina and 17 million for the Monomoy for a total of 44.4 million. To date, we have 2.5 million and 2.7 million, respectively, for the Quinner and Barnstable, for a total of 5.229 million and change orders for the for the first two vessels. And I'd be happy to answer any questions people may have. Questions from the Port Council. Matt? Um, I just want to thank Mark for this and all these odd stumbling blocks, you know, that have slowed things down in various ways, but the product, the final product, I think is going to be so good that we're going to kind of forget all that, you know, um, I do want to just ask Mark, 
is a we i think i may have asked this last month but i don't remember if i did um is this going to affect dry docking of gay head the tama and the sanctity no you, you know what i mean when i'm when i'm talking about like the time of w how long we're going to be using them because how it's going to take us a while to get the bonstable in the gay head schedule for example is what i'm saying i will defer to, to mark uh, higgins and uh and bob davis on that as i've been concentrating on the yeah on the technical part down here uh when we do get up to um the vessel when it does get up to fairhaven we are going to have um we have some operational uh, elements of training um yeah. post guard inspections but we, we're, co we're coming up with a finished product it's a it's a testing all the accommodations are complete the uh, passenger areas are complete so we're 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 looking at operation and these are very different vessels so we have to yeah have uh, time allotment put aside for for proper uh, testing. I mean, these yeah. are very different vessels yeah. than what we have right and, now. And that's why I'm asking. This is this is a big change. Like the Woods Hole having side thrusters, it's, it's, it's not something we're used to, you know? And I just figured that, that you know, we're gonna have to uh, have that kind of those dates and figure out what we're doing with the other boats as far as Hopefully there's an overlap that works. That's all. Yeah, with the with the vessels, you know, our our standard vessel, you know, for OSVs, we have one small bow thruster forward. We have three one thousand horsepower bow thrusters with two forward and uh, one aft. We have a complete CP system, which is different, except for the woods hole, but it's different in configuration in regards to the other parts of the everything coming together, the steering systems. Etc. So training is a critical part of this. So, uh, in, in terms of the dry docks, the Katama was scheduled for a dry dock this uh, this year. Uh, we had requested and got an extension on that dry dock to uh, uh, late this fall. Uh, our hopes uh, are that once we open up the the bids for the Gay Head and Katama, that um, someone um, you know some other uh, company is able to find a, a, a home for those vessels uh, prior to us needing to uh, do some dry docks. So um, you know, we, we, we don't have any room at the end, so to speak. So um, we need to figure out, we've, we have a, a Fall River State here uh, to, to birth these vessels uh, in the meantime, but um, we'll want to, uh, you know, hopefully uh, based on the interest that's people are interested in the these vessels so in that we we built in uh almost two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the training for all the crews on these vessels so we'll put there'll be a pretty intensive training regimen for people when they come up and do the, the timing and us going to the off season uh our goal is to get everybody trained so that they can work on these on these boats yeah, I understand that. I'm just, I'm just asking. I know the time. You, <laughs> I know what you're getting at. Like, yeah, when they're arriving, when we put them in service, and I, I think when you look at the off-season schedule, that this is a good time, and I, I don't foresee any problems with with a transition here. Right. I, I was talking about the the wave of thing that Bob mentioned. That that idea. I, I know it's going to be complicated to plan a, a date i don't expect that that's not what i mean i meant are we going to be okay with all the other issues with the boats we're replacing technically the gay head and the katama right now to run them further than we had originally thought that's 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 all i'm asking really yeah where we are in the katama we i believe we have an extension until uh 11 20 or 11 28 i'd have to go take a look at that but it's late november um and i don't foresee any problems with, with because we'll have the barnstable here by then we'll be in training um yeah. we're going to reduce schedule so you know i don't see a reason why we would have to then 
uh, keep the Katima and, and, and then do a dry dock at that point. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. that's what I'm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Other questions from the Port Council? Great job, Mark. Thank you very much, everyone. A lot going on down here, but I think the end product is going to be one everyone's going to be proud of when it gets up there. Hey, hey Mark, I got I got a couple of things just just of my own, if you don't mind. Before you go, sure. uh, one is uh, the three different boats, and and to what extent they're different. In other words, they're I, notionally they're identical, but to what extent are they different, and how has that impacted things? Well, in you, the difference between the boats is they are identical sisters. Uh, you would have difficulty when you walk on them and, you know, differentiating between the vessels. They are all identical. When uh, the previous operator built these, they, they made a point of making all identical for training reasons, which uh, and also for uh, spare parts. And they are identical. You will not, you'll have... The crews that come aboard, if they train on the Barnstable, when the Aquina comes up, the training will be the same. There'll be no difference between any of the vessels. And that's why we've kept everything identical going from boat A to boat, um, from Barnstable to Aquina to Monomore. Yeah. Okay, good. I understand that's the intention. That, that makes a lot of sense. I happen to uh, run some vessels that are identical that aren't identical. <laughs> uh, the other the other thing and and I, while i agree with everybody's sentiment i i do have some concern about dates uh and and you know i think in the end it'll as nat says it'll be in the rearview mirror but you know uh in june it was july and july it was july and august it was going to be uh august and now it's september and it's going to be october for sea trials on the barnstable that that's how do we reconcile that with the dates that we are getting for the other boats? Well, the sea trial date for the Barnstable is September. Um, the Aquina will be in October. Um, we, you know, manpower is a continue issue in the yard. Um, as far as the dates moving, you know, to the right, um, we don't have a lot of control on that. Um, however, I can say that right now the Barnstable is complete all the systems have been pre-tested um all the propulsion controls all the automation all the thruster controls we are really ready for the sea trial and and after the coast guard approval will be coming up on a uh, temporary coi to be completed in uh, fairhaven um, i think that the schedule that we have for barnstable and aquina uh, will go as that schedule, you know, barring hurricanes or anything else. So having said that, uh, you know, we'll see what the effect is going to be from what's happened with Francine and our contractors. But we are a little bit ahead of the, we have testing to do, and I'm just hedging myself a little bit on um, the support of those contractors in that area of Louisiana. So, and if, if I may point out too, Rob, that uh, for instance, we did the stability test on the Bonstable um, 30 days ago now, uh, and we're still waiting on the final stability letter. And I think initially we were expecting it to be, you know, two weeks, and it was three weeks. Now we're here, we're at a month. Um, and I think the the schedule that was put up there for the Aquina had a um, sea trials two weeks later after uh, the stability, inclined stability test. So obviously we'll have to revisit that um you know we don't know how the impact of these being identical whether the review of the stability tests for the equina whether that will be expedited because of the the bonstable stability calculations already being done uh or not so um but as mark pointed out there's a lot of things and still in motion the uh, yard of uh yard personnel contractors yeah, I, I, I understand all those things, uh, only all too well. I just am sort of pointing out from the perspective of us as a port council, uh, being able to rely on dates that we see and to what extent we you know think that they're uh, something that we can count on or not. Uh, but, I, I you know, I do go back to Nat's point that in the end, you know, this will be in the rearview mirror. But, you know, uh, we all have constituents and we all, you know, have our own perspectives. So I think. That's why I, I raised the question. I, I'm assuming, uh, Mark, that you know the cost of these extended delays are not being uh, 
passed on to the steamship, that these are being absorbed by the shipyard? Well, it's just work that hasn't been performed. That's in, yeah. it's in contract. Okay. So. Just want to be sure of that. Rob? Yes, go yeah. ahead, Jim. Yeah. I, one of the questions, Mark, how are the boats going to get up here? Are we hiring crews to come up here or are our own crews going to bring them up? Well, we're looking at combination of crews. Uh, you know, it's obvious that right now until, you know, uh, into late October, we have commitment. So we're going outside and uh, we'll, it'll be a combination of SSA personnel and, and outside personnel. How long does it take to come up from there? Uh, right now, our configure uh, we're figuring eight days. We have stops in Tampa, um, Port Everglades, uh, Carolinas, and then we'll be making the uh, cross across to uh, Fairhaven, Mass. But Thank eight you. day voyage. Thank you. We are limited on the fuel that we can carry, and uh, that's really the the reason for stopping in all those ports. Let me know if you want some help in the galley. <laughs> We, you know what, we do. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, back. everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bob, I guess next on the agenda is the website. Uh, so the website, so uh, Stephen is is out today. So um, I got his, I got a report for him. Um, so when we uh, included interest systems um, in the project for the website stress and performance evaluation, uh, the project is being managed a little differently. Uh, so uh, some of the numbers here that we're going to be seeing um, are, are different, but um, this was just the, the governance, uh, the program governance uh, phase of the project and, uh, you know, the responsibilities of, of the different groups within, you know, in, internally and externally uh, on what's going on uh, next. Um, and as Stephen pointed out that the, uh, uh, several activities. So right right now, um, what they've gone through, uh, for the, the, the emphasis on test cases and tasks and testing scenarios. So um, they've gone through this 23 ready for uh, execution uh, testing scenarios that they have uh, that haven't been tested yet. 12 of them have been assigned uh, to users for testing. 10 of them are in progress uh, for the, uh, for a, there's been 310 of those test cases uh, have been done and passed. There were 11 that failed that were returned back to the programmers. Um, and then there was some um, some other uh, uh, defects that were logged uh, that have been sent back. Um, that some of those are going back to the reservation system programmer. Some of them are assigned to SSA, and some of them are stellar elements. And a couple of them, interest systems, is working on. Um, and then there's uh, three three other uh, test cases that is ready for retesting that have already been addressed. So um, at this point, um, the interest systems group has gone through eight what they call sprints. Uh, they're currently working on sprint number nine. Um, and the areas that they've covered so far have been user account ma management, making a vehicle reservation, preferred space, editing a vehicle reservation, canceling a, a vehicle reservation, fast ferry reservations, auto and fast ferry uh, coupon books and gift cards. Um, they're currently working on the test cases related to the wait list and have yet, uh, not yet um, covered the e-ferry reservations and the RFID cards uh, and, uh, and working on uh, load testing. So um, right now it's required for a successful configuration of the, uh, the web service. Um, for expansion and contraction and the creation of a pre-production environment and creation of an automated test case. Uh, so security aspects of it have been have been done and, and um, taken place, but um, in the next week or so here, um, those um, cloud-based um, tests will conclude and we'll have a, a better understanding as to uh, where those stand. Um, it also involves um, some uh, live testing of credit cards on our with our, our credit card processor as well. So those those are until those have been done. Um, you know, we're in a test environment for the credit card, uh, but once we need to be testing live. So right now, um, 
the the timeline is that it'd probably be middle middle to um, middle part of October before we're ready. Um, we'll need to be doing updating uh, training manuals at that point, and uh, I think we're, we're going to need to look at um, what the scenario will be in terms of whether there's going to be you know wh how much beta testing or whether we stick with the beta testing um, through the general openings and the head start openings, so that way. Uh, our customers don't have any anxiety being on a new site. Um, so uh, those are all things that are under discussion as we as we move forward. But the the big the big items right now is to to make sure that the uh, the the web servers are, are, are set up and configured properly, and we're able to do load and also the credit card testing. Those are the the two big items right now that need to take place in the next week or so. <laughs> Questions from the board council. Mm -hmm. Hearing none, why don't we move on to the next topic? Right. Nope. Stand by, right. John. Uh, maybe I'll just hold off on my comments until we go through the IT review, if I may. Okay. Thank you. Noted. Thank you. Bob? All right, uh, so IT review is next. Um, so uh, give you an update on that. Um, work continues on the development of a list of uh, uh, functional requirements that we're gonna be needing for mm -hmm. um, the new reservation system. Um, it includes user interfaces, user management, vehicle management, uh, travel, website interface, bulk shipping, uh, customer service, special programs, accounting and billing, administrative reports, um, a parking lot element, and testing and training. Um, so um, the staff, along with um, Gibbis, are working on putting together, uh, reviewing uh, the items that we've identified as being uh, functional requirements or making sure that we've covered as much as we can. Um, we'll put that together in an RFP. Um, the proponents would then uh, need to respond on how their systems handle the functional requirements by indicating whether it's an existing component of their system, meaning it's part of the standard package, whether it's configurable set, um, setting as, a, a, it's a configuration setting that a system administrator can access, whether it's customization is gonna be required uh, whether it's a planned upgrade to the standard uh, software package or whether it's not available or would not be available. So um, as this uh, from Gibbis shows that timeline is to uh, prepare and release the RFP here this fall. Uh, there'll be a, a question and answer uh, period that we'll have with the uh, respective uh, proponents. Uh, get the proposals in uh, in the uh, sometime late winter, early spring of next year, evaluate those um, and then make, make a selection and then a kickoff following that. So um, we're looking at, you know, this coming spring um, at some point, being in a position where we've awarded, awarded the RFP to a um, you know, vendor. You know, a big piece of this is going to be the contract, making sure that the contract language covers everything and um, the review. Um, so, um, do you want to bring Tom over? He writes this Um, I guess Tom is apparently on the call somewhere. Hello everyone. Good to see you. Yeah, hello, Morning. Tom. Uh, sorry if it wasn't clear that I was I was on the call. Uh, Bob, thanks for the update. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, if I could just add on to that, um, I was just going to mention that um, the the team has really done a great job with um, you know engaging with us in terms of refining the RFP, 
Um, we've held several sessions, um, both looking at operations and and the uh, uh, the financial requirements. So we're trying to refine those. Um, I think uh, with the RFP requirements, the, the project is starting to become a little more real, uh, which is great. And so um, I think we've you know we've seen, uh, continued or increased in engagement, and uh, you know there's further discussion around you know what's the opportunity of this project to um, you know really um, you know, build build the team and um, and uh, you know using a, a major project like this to to build you know future leaders within the organization. So um, I, I'd say you know, it's very positive that way. Um, and so we've we've also started to identify what are going to be the you know some of the project champions, and then also thinking about how to how to backfill them. Um, there's uh, you know several several indicators point to you know trying to do this project um, as as quickly as possible, given the the legacy IT, and then also given the um, what the what we've heard so far from the vendors. And so we're we're looking at you know what. What would it take, you know, from an operations perspective, a hardware perspective, et cetera, to to try to do this in a in a tight timeline? Um, so, you know, going through the exercise, uh, what 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 would it take to do this, you know, in something like like a year as opposed to you know a two or three year timeline? So, you know, trying to to think through because um, uh, a project of this of this size and scale, um, it it will never take less time than you planned, um, you know. So if, if we if we plan on eighteen months, it's not going to take less than eighteen months. So you know, trying to go through the 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 exercise now, I'm saying, okay, what what would it take to get there, you know, as quickly as possible, and um, knowing that you know the actual timeline won't won't be clear until you know, the vendors on board, the vendor signed, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, really taking this opportunity to, you know, start thinking through what are all those change management pieces that that need to happen uh, to, you know, get get everything in place. This, this project comes together given the the size and scope of the. Thank you, Tom. Uh, any questions from the board council? John, I think you had a at least a comment, if not a question. Well, you know, just to support what Tom had to say was that, you know, I think what the Steamship Authority has to do now is really identify who the champions are going to be to be able to get the rest of the team behind this. Um, personally, I believe we can do this thing in a year. Um, and I'd like to just challenge the Steamship Authority management and the IT group to think about that seriously. Um, and that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thanks, John. Other comments or questions? Yeah, Rob, just a question of pure ignorance being technologically yep. challenged. Is the reservation system going to be a standalone entity or is it integrated with or just linked <clears throat> to the new website? How how does the, the website that we're about to launch in October relate A to the RFP and then B to the reservation system once it starts getting built next year? Um, I, I can help with that. The, um, yeah, so the, the, uh, the new reservation system would be exposed through the website. And so the, the, uh, the experience that the, the public would have working with the new reservation system is going to be through the website. There's a few different ways to do that. Um, but that'll be, that'll be their, their front door. That'll be how they see the reservation system. Um, and then the uh, and then similar to how it works today, internal staff will see the the reservation system, um, you know the the user interface that that's specific to the reservation system. So if I'm a reservation system contractor uh, looking to respond to the RFP, I will want to have seen the new website then, right, and experience that. I'm just it's a timing question of. If we're launching the new website in October, we're probably not launching the RFP prior to that. Is that fair? 
Rob, if I may, I can probably help answer that question. Thank you, John. Yep. Good. Uh, just to give Tom some breathing space here. Um, the website was designed on the old existing reservation system. Um, what we've learned through this process, unfortunately, is that we probably should have started with updating the reservation system first. Okay. Um, but here's where we are. Um, I would be, I would not be surprised that we would have to quickly, um, what's the word I would use? Uh, not as extensive as this existing website launch, but quickly make modifications or completely change the existing website. To refresh of some kind, yeah. Yes, and not a simple refresh. So the, the question that really has been raised a couple of times is, would we be better off putting this existing website that we're hoping to launch, uh, underline the word hoping, on the shelf for a period of time until we have further definition as to what we're going to be doing with the reservation system. As painful as that sounds, that needs to be said. If that helps. It does. Any comment from management on that question, on that point? Well, um, so I, I think the, the piece of it is that from a customer standpoint, the website and the reservation system seem to be one and the same, and they're not the two distinct si systems. Um, the the website that's under development uh, now, um, you know, part of that was because of the some of the failures that we had um, on general openings and, and and the like, where it wasn't able to uh, maintain the connectivity, and that's why we were focusing on the on the website because uh, it was the website that failed, not the reservation system at the time. So, um, you know, we're, we've been moving along here, what seems like an eternity on the website. Uh, I think we're seeing the, the finish line a little clearer now based on conversations with the, uh, um, the, the, the team that's been brought in to, uh, to, to help get us that final push over, over the line. Um, the, a new web, uh, a new reservation system. Uh, maybe it'll de be dependent upon who the final contractor is. Um, it may be accessed through um, APIs off the new website to the back, you know, the back of the uh, reservation system and integrated that way. Um, if we're talking about a reservation system vendor, then also supplying a, a website. Um, you know, where, where's your expertise on all that and all the front end then would have to be rebuilt. So it, it is a, you know, a, a big, discuss, big discussion. And, uh, you know, when we get the proposals, um, you know, that'll be something that, you know, we'll see what, what any proponent is proposing, whether that, you know, whether that's the route that they would rather take. But um, I think the idea being is that, you know, the, the, the back office connection to the, the, the connections on the website to the reservation system, um, my understanding, and Tom may be able to correct me, but that it's it's designed so that way we could then, you know, make some switches to go to point it to a new new system and the new and the new code that would be on a new system. So, Rob, yes, Joe. Yeah, I would go. Can I try to interrupt? I just want to like to hear Tom's response to that. I'm sorry, Joe. That's okay. Oh. Did, um... yeah, yeah i mean so so i mean to to the first question that was asked a, a little while ago the um the the two can go on on two different paths for now um they are they're still competing for internal resources and time and attention right because they're both major projects um but the 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 timeline of the website does not um uh, does not delay getting the requirements out to out to bidders because we're actually the way that we post it we've we've asked you know we're going to ask the vendors please tell us you know, how you recommend connecting to our website because right they they do this for every other user of their system and so they can go down the path of an API where it's sending messages back and forth. And that's how the the new website is being designed to have messages back and forth, or it can be uh, 
uh, an iframe, which is essentially uh, websites or most websites are a whole bunch of boxes. And so they'll, they'll give us the information to show up in the, in the box that says reservation. And then we'll make it our colors and our fonts and it'll look, it'll look like it's one website, but, but those pieces will be, you know, talking directly with the, with the reservation system. Um, so it, it it won't the 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 it won't delay the requirements um, because in, in part we're planning to ask the vendor for, for how they would suggest doing it. Um, the the there is a challenge that the um, maintaining the the API connection those will all have to be rebuilt for for the future reservation system. All of them. Well, yes, yeah, I would go along with John. It seems to me that we should delay the, the, the website and try to do these both at the same time. You know, even with the boats, it took longer for the boats to come up, come up but we're making sure that they're safe and it's correct. And maybe we should be doing both of these at the same time and have them come out at one particular point in time. If we're going to be waiting until January or February for this new website to come in, why not wait till next October or November and have the both of them come out at the same time? John, is that possible? I don't I know. You're the, um, you're the expert. On I, this. I think that would be an aggressive. It's possible, but it would take a tremendous amount of resources to make that reservation system happen in that time frame. I don't think this could be done in nine months. It could it be From done the in a year? Where the RFP is accepted. Maybe so the just, RFP has been accepted, it would take nine months. Let me just pose sort of the opposite end of that the continuum, which I have no idea. I don't know how at risk our reservation system is. We know we've had issues in January every year, but could you not do that and get the website up and running and make sure you have that as a finished product before you undertake this? Or does that mean you undo everything you did for the new website when you have your new reservation system yeah, that's, that's a, what a year or two down the road? Um, I will just tell you, my we're, so we're this close theoretically to having yeah. a website. Yeah, um, back in November of 22, when I realized um, what was happening with the reservation system and how it was constructed and who was managing it, I brought it to the Board of Governors attention that it's a significant risk to the business and it needed to be addressed and quickly. So here we are in September of 24 and it's still a risk. It's fragile. We've all seen not only the expense of trying to keep it managing it, but it's run by one guy who lives in Wisconsin on the table, but this is not how we want to operate going forward. So we need to make the change to a new reservation system quickly. If it takes nine months, that's still too long. But these are two independent things. And in my opinion, shelving the website makes a lot of sense because you're not having resources spread out too thin. That's all I'll say. Thank okay, you. John, thank you. Eric? Thanks, John. Hi, thanks. Um, we've, we've been building pretty complicated databases for about 30 years uh, for the government. Actually, uh, my wife created and designed the first uh, Maritime Administration tool to actually operate what the Coast Guard's National Maritime Center is now. And uh, so we, we build very robust systems. Um, none of this is rocket science. I'm listening to this and I'm like, wow, this is almost, you know, a, an opportunity to just spend money and waste money. Um, a website's really easy to build these days, especially with AI. Um, you can you could build your whole website in a week, quite frankly, and make it function. Anybody that tells you differently, they're full of baloney. The um, the database, you know, and you don't want to get rid of your website project because you've invested so much into it at this stage. You know, make it whole. And the database you can sew into the website pretty seamlessly with not much complication. Um, you know, the database shouldn't take you a year. I, I agree with John Cahill. Um, 
it, it's pretty straightforward building this database. You, you, you have all the operational norms that uh, you've engaged in to take reservations for decades and decades and decades. You know, you know your business. Steamship does a great job of interfacing with its customers. Uh, Nat, you know yeah. the system. You know, you know how it all works and the logistics. And you know, this is this is really straightforward stuff. You, you and again, you've got operational norms that I guarantee you are already there on paper. So it's basically just transferring that into your uh, design architecture and letting some young people go to it. Um, this shouldn't this shouldn't take the time that it's been taking. I don't mean to be rude to anybody or or you know suggest that people aren't doing their jobs, but this is real straightforward stuff in the 21st century, especially in the year 2024 with AI. You can build this stuff in you know, seconds compared to weeks just a few years ago. So I, I really recommend that uh, honest dialogue takes place. Um, so the end users, the customers, aren't left waiting and, and holding the bag to operate their businesses and to get the services to the islands that are required to support uh, the people that really need this institution to run properly in, in this electronic process is really critical in today's day and age. So I think we need to figure out how to help um, management make good cogent decisions, but this isn't stuff that takes a long time. It really isn't. The world has changed dramatically and goodness in just the last year alone um, with, with uh, AI. So I, I just really suggest people do a little bit of research um, on this and, and really help support uh, the decision makers to get this done quickly. But you, you don't have to scuttle ever anything. It, it's everything can be sewn together within days uh, and pretty seamlessly. So um, we also own a, uh, a very large um, educational software company that uh, produces this work in um, to the point of facial recognition database systems to monitor people taking exams. It's one of the most robust systems in education, and uh, it didn't take us a year to build, um, you know, with a very small team, a half dozen kids that, uh, you know, we just hired good, smart, young people, and this can be done for sure. Thanks, Eric. Any uh... Other comments from the Port Council or comments from management uh, from these comments from the Port Council? Obviously, you've kind of heard a, a spectrum of ideas and thoughts. Um, good generative discussion. So thanks for that, everybody. Bob, Tom, anything else? No, I think I'm good. Tom? Tom? No, I think I think that, that covers it. I mean, I mean to, to Eric's point, the... You know, he's he's you know he he's right. Modern systems, you can move much faster. Um, the the biggest challenge of the new reservation system is really going to be the operational change, the the change management, the getting people used to using a new system, and you know doing their work a little differently. And it's going to change everything, and it's going to change right. It, the basics of like, you know, instead of going to the left, you're going to go to the right. And, you know, if you've been doing, you know, you know, if you've been doing things for 30 years where you always turn left and now we ask you to turn right, that's a big change. It's going to be hard. Um, and so a major part of, the, you know, the new reservation system is really going to be that change management piece. The, you know, part of the reason why, you know, the focus is on going with a system that, you know, is is already in the market, is already implemented. We're not developing a system. It's it's all about how to configure that system to what the steamship needs, and then um, and then that that process of really making sure that everybody, um, you know, is is ready for ready for that day one launch, and and having all the pieces in place, and having the the network ready, having all the hardware ready, having all the people ready. So it's a it's a it's a big it's a change exercise and that's that's um, 
you know, part of part of why I mentioned the, you know, that this is offer, an opportunity to build future leaders of the organization because it's it's also an opportunity for everyone to say, okay, you know, we've we've worked a certain way. Now we're going to have to change that. So you're going to see with the new reservation system, it's it's going to work a little different at you know at the terminals. It's going to work differently when you go through the website. It's going to work differently when you're calling customer service. All those things are going to to change, and it's it's gonna it's gonna be a big burden on the organization to to get there. Um, but the you know our our hope is that you know with the with replacing a lot of legacy technology with the new system that you know that the change is really an, an more of an operational challenge than a technology challenge yeah i guess if i had to sort of summarize what i've just heard this is really a management question more than it is a technical one it sounds like our expertise, our experts, our subject matter experts on the Port Council, which we have some, um, think that technically this is very doable. And so really it's about managing this process in the best way possible, I guess, under the given circumstances we have, which relate to, you know, the, the status of the website project and uh, internal resources, all those things. But it sounds like this is really a management issue or question. Any other comments, uh, input from uh, either? Just, just one Council quick either. one, Rob, if I may. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I'm Tom or Bob, I don't know who's best to answer this. How can we maybe accelerate this RFP so it actually goes out before the end of 2024 and we're able to get somebody on board early in the spring? Or maybe February, March, is that possible? I well, I think, yeah. yeah, right now the stoke they're reviewing the functional requirements. And as soon as that's done, then we, we get it to procurement and they put it in the, the format that we need to send it out. There's an advertising requirement that we need to post. Um, something like this. It's gonna, you know, we'll we'll undoubtedly get uh, a series of questions from vendors. Uh, so we'll have to end up be putting out um I would anticipate there probably be multiple addendums based on you know you know when the questions are uh, come in and things like that. So um, the goal isn't to have it out in December. The goal is to have it out here. You know whether it's later this month or the beginning of October. So okay, thank you. But the the, the series of the, you know the functional requirements is. You know, we've already identified, you know, there's a, a series of, of things, whether it's on the reporting side or accounting side or the operation side or the reservations, the bulks. There's a series of questions uh, I has, has to guess on how many that there are, but there's clearly there's hundreds of them uh, that we're going to want each, each vendor to identify. As I said, those, you know, whether it's something that they have, they could do or it's not something that they have, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's move on to a simple project. <laughs> <laughs> the Woods Hall Turbo. Yes. Bob, that was a good one, Rob. That's the simple <laughs> project. Nine years, uh, maybe not. No, what, when did this all start? 2015? 11 years. 11 years. <laughs> Is it? Oh my God. Oh, jeez. Bob has it in his head. Oh, my God. Uh, Bob, over to you. Uh, waiting for uh, Sean to come over uh, okay. to give the update here and be brief about it. So. <laughs> brief update, shall I say. Sean, you there? Sorry, I was muted. Morning, everyone. Morning. Uh, I don't. I don't know about simple project, but <laughs> uh, all right. The first slide is showing our first wall port, the utility building. It's about eighty yards. It was poured back on August thirteenth. Um, next slide, please. This was. These show the uh, first wall pour being stripped, and the second wall pour. Uh, formwork and rebar being installed. 
Next slide, please. This is uh, showing the floor mark all installed the day before the pour, showing uh, the pour on the wall, the second section of wall uh, at the utility building on August 29th. It's about, eh, about 88 yards, I believe, we poured. Next slide, please. This shows the uh, second wall pour being stripped. The first wall pour to the left is already stripped. Concrete concrete work is coming out very nice, nice and smooth. It looks good. It's got a lot of holes. You can see that uh, you know it's all for uh, piping, utility work, geothermal work that'll be going through the building. The upper right hand corner shows a door. That's like the uh, first floor door opening. Next slide, please. Currently, we are working on this section of wall formwork. Um, the wood panels are in place. We are installing rebar today. Um, projects move along very, very smoothly so far. Um, I've a uh, Laframboise well drilling back on site today. They're starting to drill the last seven wells down in the parking staging area. Uh, should take about two weeks for that and the lateral trenching. And then we'll move over to the next two lanes and it'll probably be another two weeks. And sometime in October, we'll dig down in front, setting up construction fence for the terminal building. Next slide, please. Uh, so far, we've had two change orders. One was uh, for stone on the foundation. The other one was for uh, some unforeseen conditions. I've got some... Um, almost for the terminal building relocation and the curtain wall glass we've got a couple credits so basically we're ahead sixteen thousand two hundred forty two dollars point zero five percent and the total so far is thirty two million one hundred eighteen thousand two hundred eighty eight dollars and ninety nine cents anyone has any questions be happy to answer questions from the board council Hey, Sean, just for uh, uh, reference, what, how many square feet is that building? Is that... They, they're both about 4,000. Okay. Just trying to get a sense of scale. Thank you. Yeah. And any idea on timing? Our schedule shows us being completed with both buildings in the spring of 2026. Other questions from anyone? Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. All right, so the next item we have on the agenda is just um, is noted uh, that the presented and approved 2025 operating schedules contained a couple of minor typos or omissions or errors, uh, be it made. Um, so we wanted to just correct those for, uh, on the record. On the vineyard route, the schedule from uh, January 4th to uh, March 25th for 2025, trip 204 uh, will, will not, uh, uh, it was listed as operating daily and uh, it shouldn't be operating daily. It should be listed as Monday through Saturday. Uh, during that same time period, trip, trip 224 uh, will not operate Monday and Sunday uh, should have been listed as Monday through Saturday. Um, the same schedule also had the operating times that we listed below for the uh, MB Aquina um, didn't actually reflect the times that the actual schedule had above. So that's been updated. Um, in the March 26 through May, 20, uh, May 12th, 2025, trips 203 and 204 will not operate daily as originally you know, presented. Uh, they operate Monday through Saturday. Um, during that same time period, the operating times listed below for the MB Woods Hall uh, need to be corrected to reflect that uh, the, the time, the, the actual times that have shown up above on the schedule. And then in the fall, October 22nd through uh, January 4th, 2026. Um, down below, um, 
the schedule had identified that the MB would hold not operate on Thanksgiving Day, November 28, 2025. Well, Thanksgiving Day is actually November 27, 2025. And then um, down below the operating times for the MB Woods Hall need to be corrected to uh, reflect the actual times of, this, of the trips up above. And then on the Nantucket route, um, the May 13th, 2025 for June 17th, 2025, um, we've added in the, the, the plan and repair dates. Um, the, the, the vineyard schedule showed those spruce up periods, but the Nantucket one didn't. So we want to just get that, uh, put that up there. Um, it doesn't change any of the schedule. Um, and then on the October 12th, uh, 2022, uh, October 22nd through January 4th schedule on the Nantucket route. Um, the note below indicated that trips uh, 301, 302, 305, 306, 309, and 310 will not operate on Thanksgiving Day, November 28th, 2024. Obviously, it needs to be changed to November 27th, 2025. And Christmas uh, was listed as uh, 12 25 2024 and we need to update that to 12 25 2025 so uh, we consider these minor edits we just wanted to correct them on the record um just so that it's it's clear on what the dates are okay comments questions <clears throat> from the board council that um i don't want to bring this stuff up as a you know god too much to say, I guess, but since we're talking about this, um, Allison, I think you can answer this, although I'm not sure out of your head you can answer it, but I think when the bulks, when do the bulks go out? Uh, based on this last three weeks of our conversations that we've had, um, when do the bulks go out for um well actually no i already know the answer to this the, so it goes from may right through to october 22nd doesn't it yes all right so if we want to make some changes that reflect some of the stuff that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks which is really efficient and better for the whole entire system in this odd time slot we're in right now how mm -hmm. Is there is it possible to have the bulks go through that whatever that magic date in September is when we sort of change what is what like this year it's the sixth but next year it might be a different date. Is that yeah, next possible? Year the so next year the, yeah, so you want to do the bulks from the May date till September 9th? In I mean, I just I mean, when do they go out? anyway like pretend we're not doing anything different what would we um, in, a couple, in a few weeks next few weeks okay yeah oh, all oh, right, no, this, just right now, i just so. think that some of the things we've discussed are so yeah. positive yeah. that i think we should try to look at that you know the the single crew thing and not having any gas on Saturday for that September through October, whatever the whatever the date yeah. is. Every year it's different. So I you know what I mean when I say that. God, I can't stand that. It, whatever it is. The nine the seven, the seven weeks of uh whatever it is. <laughs> Summer, but it isn't fall, but it isn't. And um trying to come up with a better way to do it. And then the whole fast boat thing, I think that's an easy one to solve without even touching anything with the schedule as far as what we've approved or not. It's really more about the vehicle boat system than it is that. So is that okay, Bob? Am I gone too far? Is this okay to talk about? <laughs> so you're talking about delaying the bulks for the September 10th through October 21st time period is what you're yeah. saying. Yes. Because so that, way we can, that way we can see once we have some some experience with loading the new vessels on any potential impacts on that and being able to 
do kind of like, you know, I like to give my vineyard members a little credit here for art. You know, we have this art flathers sort of comment that we use. It's sort of a 20 year, uh, <laughs> you know, he's still with us, John. He's still <laughs> with us. Um, well, we can maybe tweak the fall to a, be more efficient and less wasted crews on Sundays and and have Saturday be a non-hazardous day instead of having gas on Saturdays and have those boats be in the system as bookable for everything. Like, you know, like the Woods Hole was on, Allison, okay? In theory, as a freight boat. Um, I just think we need to have this conversation and try to figure that out. I've already talked to the to the gas people stuff and that it can work perfectly fine in the five days at that period because we're going to have a boat that carries more. So it's going to change everything, you know? And I just don't want, you know, to just say ho-hum business as usual. We need to make some slight improvements and it will help everybody the traveling public will be happier to have those boats not have gas on saturday and secondly having that two single idea during a week is going to is a game changer um like we did a long time ago with the sanctity schedule back in the day when we tightened it up from monday through friday so that's my thought yeah, so the two single crews, if I'm not mistaken, would be Monday through Friday, correct? Monday through Friday, yep. No weekend service or the right. You have you have you you'd have you have the Eagle and the whatever the other freight boat would be running on that six thirty noon five thirty opposite the Eagle schedule, um, or we have the other boat five thirty. 11 10 45 you know depending upon what we decide in that particular one one of them whatever one's triple crewed would would be not hazardous on saturday right and then the double crew would be the two, two single days, two singles days. would be monday through friday and, two singles and monday through friday and double is seven days a week but two trips the we, we can go back and look at the occupancy yeah. and what what request we had for this this fall and see if there's any adjustment. But we had already been doing that when we when we originally presented the 2025 schedule. But um, it's you know we could we can take a look at it again. Yeah. Essentially, um, essentially, Bob, can... to be to be simple, we're running the summer schedule to October 22nd if we leave it the way it is like this year was going to be and and i think we can make it work a little bit more efficiently without having that sort of triple saturday night sunday morning sort of you know not needing those boats you know what i mean and having it tighten up monday through friday and get all the all the gas done in five days for that seven week period instead of having saturday be hazardous so anyway, okay. Thank you for your time. Sorry to be talking shop here at poor council meeting, but you so know, good. It's, better always, than, it's better than going to Falmouth. <laughs> I, I always a day off for this. Oh my God. <laughs> Matt, we Matt, always you appreciate your very we, well. We, we miss you too, Matt. <laughs> uh, it's it's great. I, I guess the question I would have for you, Bob, is we have sort of two two layers here. One is modest typo fixes and yeah. others somewhat more substantive potential, I guess, where in what, you know, what are the mechanisms at, at uh, your disposal do you have to, to make adjustments like what Matt's proposing and that anybody else might propose at this stage of the game? Well, I think what the, the, the first thing would probably be to, to look at not having um, the bulks have to go all the way through October 22nd of uh, uh, 21st of next year and have it go through um, September 9th. And then it gives us some time to, to be looking at, um, you know, some, some of the other traffic numbers and, um, you know, what the, uh, 
Yeah, so I understand. I understand. I guess the gist of my question is the process by which we would make any kinds of adjustments to what has already been approved. Um, this would, uh, in this case, he's, he's actually talking about a reduction. So it'd be something that we'd come back to the board and for council and advise kind of like what we did earlier this year where we reduced the schedule because of the manning issues that we had. So we come back to the poor council and board for uh, um, for approval, I believe. Okay. I know that, you know, the, the major undertaking each year is a, is the public comment period and so on and so forth. Yeah. I just want to be sure that we, you know, don't have to unwind that effort that's already been done for this other questions or comments from the board council? Are you looking for any action from us relative to these changes, or is this for information purposes? Uh, this is for information purposes. The, the, the uh, you know, it's some typos or some omissions on the on the on the language that's down below that don't don't pertain to the schedules themselves. Very good. Okay. Thank you, and thanks, Nat, for your in insights. Thank you. Rob. Okay. I think Mr. Roseman's up next. I think we are ready for the business summary. Good morning, everyone. Hello, Mark. So we got the business summary for the month of July. Okay, passengers carried for the month of July. Uh, the Vineyard Road was down about 9,300 passengers at 2.8 percent. The Nantucket Run was up. I, I was down 30, just under 3,800 passengers at 4.8 percent. Both routes combined were down 13,000 passengers at 3.1 percent. Uh, year to date, we're up uh, just under 5,700 passengers at 0.4 percent. And I want to remind everyone, last month we talked about the difference in the calendar where June had more weekends in 24 and 23, and as expected, July 23 had more weekends in 24. So this was uh, kind of anticipated as far as the uh, downturn in the numbers go. So it's reversed the uh, trends we saw last month. Same thing will apply to the vehicles under 20 feet. Uh, so the vineyard route, we're down just over 2,900 pa uh, passenger vehicles. And again, this is all one-way statistics. Um, the Nantucket run is down 2,304 vehicles to 21.1%. And total vehicles for the month are down 7.3%. Um, last month, we were up 1,000 passenger vehicles in this category. Um, the result of the Nantucket run is really... Uh, Attribute, mostly attributed to the uh, change in the uh, schedule with the uh, sanctity being smaller than the Woods Hole. Uh, but the trend continues with the downturn in the uh, standard auto fares, and uh, that'll have an impact on uh, the 2025 budget with the uh, decrease in the standard fares. Uh, freight trucks for the month um, were up 7.6% or 699 vehicles for both routes. Uh, pretty evenly distributed between the Vineyard Route and the Nantucket Route. Year to date, we're up 1.8% or 1,062 vehicles over 20 feet. Cars parked for the month were down 6.4% or just under 1,800 vehicles, with the Vineyard Route down 952 and the Nantucket Route down 831 cars parked. But year to date, we're up 3.2% or 2,925 vehicles with the vineyard route up and the Nantucket route being down. Trip summary for the month of July. Um, for the month combined, we had a total of 17 mechanical trips canceled, zero for weather, eight for traffic, and 210 for crewing. And these are one-way trips. Um, of that 210 number, 200 of them were attributable to the um, previously approved restated schedule. We're on the Nantucket route. We had 62 trips on the IANO, and on the Vineyard route, we had 138 trips for the uh, Sanctity. Financial snapshot for the month of July: uh, total revenues combined is down, not down 951,000. Um, we have a offering all total expenses. We're down 221,000. Putting this combined, we have a net offering loss of 729,000. Uh, for the month, um, comparing that to last month, we had a net income of 627000 So the months of June and July pretty much washed each other out. 
Year to date, we have a net operating income of uh, $3.3 million, um, which is $1.7 million ahead of budget. For the month, we had a net operating income of $8.4 million. Operating revenues for the month of July, uh, as, as would be expected with the traffic numbers being down, we were down 3.6 overall. Um, the freight was up according, uh, accordingly with the traffic statistics in the automobile and passenger revenues and uh, parking were down. Uh, year to date, uh, operating revenues are down 1.4%, just over $1.1 million. Operating expenses for the month of June were uh, down $168,000. Um, first thing, fuel um, is uh, was down for the month. We budgeted three twenty-six. dollars It came in at $2.93. Um, year to date, we're under budget by about $0.35 cents a gallon. Um, it saved us about $982,000 on the budget compared to budget. Um, and we are fully hedged for next year's budget. Um, year to date, operating expenses are down $1.9 million at 2.4%. Uh, for the month of August, we have passengers carry. Um, total passengers for both routes combined are down 1.2%, with the vineyard being up just over 1,000 passengers and the Nantucket route being down uh, 63, just under 6,300 passengers. Year to date, we're virtually flat. Okay, uh, total, for, total vehicles carried. The vineyard route for the month of August was up 448 vehicles. Nantucket was down just under 1,600 uh, total vehicles um, for the month of August. And if I may, I have a quick summary for the three summer months of June, July, and August to kind of encapsulate what we've seen over the last three months for traffic. Just to summarize it real quick. So in the vineyard route for the months of June, July, and August compared to last year, passengers were up uh, 8,477 passengers at just over 1%. The Nantucket route was down 5.4% or just under 11,500 passengers and total passengers for both routes combined were down just over 3,000 passengers of 0.3%. And again, this is all one-way traffic. Um, so for the June, July, and August for the vineyard route, uh, total vehicles carried we're down 503 vehicles or 0.3%. Uh, the Nantucket route was down 9.8% or just over 4,000 vehicles. And on the Nantucket route, you can see the standard uh, fare vehicles um, were down roughly 3,600 of that 4,000 vehicles. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has regarding the traffic or the financials. Open for discussion. Anyone from the Port Council with questions, comments? I'm ready when you are, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, Nat. <laughs> Looks like uh, Nantucket has uh, got some changes. No, well, it, and this is why I want to talk about this more than even the last thing I talked about, kind of. I want my vineyard constituents to really open up their minds a little bit, Okay. So you should have told us that two hours ago. Well, uh, you reopen it then. <laughs> All so right. Mark's done an incredible job here with all this. I, I I I hate this stuff. Okay. Just every Eric's the new guy. Gordon's, you know, been in here a little bit longer. He's probably figured me out by now. I can't stand all this complicated gobbledygook. All right. But I Not yet, by the way. But so I fun. understand. I understand it in a way that I don't have to know how we got to that to understand it. Okay. okay. Mark, figured out. I can't stand saying this, but I'm going to do it. That without the woods hole, and we needed to not have the woods hole this summer. We needed to not have it because the vineyard situation was ridiculously a disaster without having it. It would not, you would not have gotten the gas over here. I mean, once I learned that, once I got that explained to me as to how that all worked over there with the Sanctity and the, and the governor, which I didn't understand until whatever the date was that we had to make that decision late in May, I think. Mark, you know, sharpening his pencil, figured out that we lost $10,000 a day without the Woods Hole. 
So I'm sitting there going, okay, where did everybody go? Like, how did that happen? Well, it isn't just one thing that caused that. It, it isn't, oh, these vehicles just magically went somewhere else or went to Block Island or went to the Cape. They just found a different way to either not come, people came on the fast boat or whatever ended up happening, but the vehicles and, and the passengers that would have been carried on that boat did not get carried. And this is was a, ne a necessity scenario to happen re regardless. If, if Mark said, we're going to lose $10,000 a day in May, if we give up the Woods Hole, I would have said, we have to give up the Woods Hole because that's what was the right thing for the system of both islands. But I think it's really a good exercise for us as a group to understand the impacts of something on Nantucket versus the vineyard. That's what I'm getting at, John and Joe. The things that go on over here, uh, we might as well be in another country, okay? They don't make any sense to you guys. And the stuff that goes on over there makes no sense to me. But I've learned an awful lot in the last six months about the vineyard than I ever knew in the last 19 and a half years I've been doing this. So I just wanted to be on the record explaining that even if we knew what was going to happen without the Woods Hole, because I don't think we really figured it out the year before um, with the fast boat at night. That's nothing compared to this. We we don't even need the fast boat in the summer at 730. But we need that regular boat opposite the Eagle running three trips a day, seven days a week. That needs to be a real boat. And we found out what happens if it's not. And I think it's really good for management, for us, for the board to understand these nuances that we never even talked about and ever contemplated. So thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Mark and staff for figuring this stuff out. I think it's a good exercise, similar to the hedging, all these other things that we figured out over time. This one here is something new we've never done before, have a summer schedule without the other passenger boat, like whether it was the Nantucket, dare I say the Uncatina, but I mean, that's what we had opposite the eagle forever until this year so there you go joe i mean john i'm sorry uh thank thanks rob uh not thank you for the comments I, I have a question for you because you are the expertise on uh, the boats and the schedules how will the new boats once they're up and running help alleviate some of these concerns for nantucket all the stuff i like i just talked to allison about did, yeah. did, did you catch that okay so with these boats being, Bob, correct me, Mark, H, is that the letter? Subchapter H, yes. This H boat thing, John. Yeah. By having the Vonstable, which is going to end up being the woods hole that you don't drive on straight as much, okay? In theory, even though it's not going to carry as many passengers, that it will not it'll be able to be on the printed schedule on the website for booking it's going to have the ability for a car getting on the boat but not being told sorry you passengers can't go with the car because it's overdraft that is is insanity but that's what happens with the sanctity and the gay head and the container right. right at certain times yeah but by having the bondstable or the Aquina or the Monomoy in the system, replacing one of those three boats is going to give a huge, it's going to help you too. It's going to give a big advantage for people booking cars in mixed loads. I mean, Allison can explain that technically better than me. I'm just saying that's what's going to happen. This is going to be a huge positive result for the, just the general travel in public, whether they're originating in Hyannis or originating here. Yeah. And having like having a boat, for example, 5.30 p.m. from Hyannis, a slow boat that carries people. When you, when you miss the five o'clock, 
you'd have to wait for the later boat. You're in, you're on a boat to get you home at seven thirty, like that kind of stuff. These different scenarios are going to take place because we've never had a boat like that other than the summer. Yeah. And it's going to change. It's going to make a big change. That's why I want to work on this shoulder thing for the weekend so we don't have these glitches with hazardous then we don't have to do it just for that short amount of time after after october 22nd we have to have the week saturday gas because of there's less service and it's the weather changes and all that but i'm talking about this little these shoulder pots in may mid-april to june 15th and this this weird september labor day through yep whatever it, it's a it's a it's a gray area time and we fixed it a long time ago but now we're in a different era we have to like look at it at it again agree you guys over there i i, I don't try to follow what's going on with the schedule and this number of boats but what happened with that morning thing if you didn't have the woods hole it would have been a major you know i mean you would i don't even know what the other solution would have been so there was no other solution. So, okay. Anyway, thank you. Mr. Chair, may I add on to Nat's comments? Please, please do. Um, yeah. So when we changed the Woods Hole and placed the sanctioning governor, the aggregate overall capacity on a seven day cycle on the Woods Hole run came up to about 90, eight and a half percent of what the other boat, well, what the other schedule, the original schedule would have been. The Nantucket route dropped down into the lower 90s. Uh, with next year's, with the new boats and next year's schedule, um, the Nantucket runs overall capacity in a seven day uh, period will increase to about 6% during the week. So that'll help. But as Nat uh, eloquently pointed out, the H boat is a big help where no matter what the boat's carrying, once it's hazardous, passengers can go, all, go on the boats. Um, when we have the governor and sanctity running, oftentimes we have to turn people away. Uh, because the boats sit too deep in the water. Benefit from having the Woods Hole on the vineyard route this year, we didn't run into that problem. Um, so the new boats plus the Woods Hole is going to give us uh, a greater um, flexibility and convenience for our customers when they the walk on specifically in the automobiles. Hey, can I can I ask? I just thought of something, Mark. Oh my God! Can I just ask one more thing, Rob? Please do. Next summer, Allison, you're laughing. I see you there. <laughs> so, so um, do we, are we, we are getting both. We're not going to have the Woods Hole next summer. We're going to have both of the new boats, correct? That's correct. Okay. So, John. Yes. So back to you. I'm going to ask your follow-up. So how is that going to affect us? Well, <sighs> the only thing about that issue that we have to try it. This is a test. We, the management, I've talked to them on the phone about all these kind of things. This was something Mark came up with a while ago when this all was conceptually thought of with these new boats way before they were in Alabama. Okay. That someday Nantucket's going to have to give up the Woods Hole in the summer if we get the right mix until the next build cycle of Woods Hole class boats happens. Hopefully, I'll still be here. Okay. But the only difference with this, the only concern that we have, and this is going to be a test that we have to run this test, is the timing of turnarounds and the number of passengers they, that these boats carry versus the Woods Hole is going to be I don't think we're going to turn people away. I don't think we're going to reach capacity all of a sudden. Oh, sorry, you got to go cuz there's other options. They can we can give them a fast boat uh waiver or something like that if they have the car on the other boat. There are things that we can do on our route that don't inconvenience people like it would on yours, okay? Just by having that 1045 trip that would be normally non-hazardous most of the time, but have a capacity with passengers with the weight of the boat, that's going to change everything right there. Just that 1045 trip being able to carry people 
versus what it does today, right now, is going to be a game changer of spreading out passengers in their cars. So we, is that correct, Allison, what I'm saying? Yeah, um, yeah. I was going to say it also should be noted that next summer for the vineyard ride, it's a four boat schedule, not the five boat schedule, with the 530 having to be a drive on boat. Yep. And that's and that's part of this, the internal plan to improve that situation you guys have with that 530 mess. And then at the same time, we are sort of the test model for these two boats. You know, so it's good for both islands. It's just, we got to kind of like press the press a pause and like, let's get through that because these are good problems now. When, right. Once we get these boats in, this is a good problem, not a bad problem. Right. We'll figure it out. Yes, exactly. And the turnaround and they're going to loop the cars around. It's going to be a whole different conversation as far as like the how they load the boats. They're going to have that figured out. By the time someone rolls around, the guys, you know, the deck people are all going to have it figured out. So I'm, I'm really excited about this because it's a good future situation to deal with. So I try to be positive, John, over here on the, on the faraway island. <laughs> the, the lesser isle. <laughs> okay, anything, anything further on the uh, business summary of questions from the board council? Okay, thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. It looks like we have another item on the a new item on the agenda. Yeah. So, um, Bob, are back you? in yeah, back in two thousand seven, upon the arrival of the uh, MV Island home, the Steamship Authority was presented and loaned a model of the new island home, which you're seeing on the screen now. Uh, it was crafted by vineyard resident uh, Donald Widmeyer Sr. Uh, the model was placed on display aboard the, uh, the island home in the area next to the purse's office. Approximately two years ago, it was noted that the model had incurred some slight damage. Uh, some of the masts had fallen down, some of the railings had fallen down. Um, it didn't appear to be malicious in nature, but rather perhaps from the vessel movements and vibrations over the years. So. The model was removed from on board the island home in order for repairs to be made. Those repairs, as you can see now, have been, have been completed and uh, the model was returned to our offices here in, uh, in Falmouth. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Widmeyer Sr. passed away back in 2013. Uh, his family members noted the absence of the model on board the vessel while um, traveling this summer and inquired about the status. Um, so once we informed them about the uh, reason for the model's removal from the vessel and its planned return to uh, be displayed, the family wished to make this a permanent gift to the Steamship Authority and not a loan. Uh, so staff just wanted to public, publicly acknowledge this uh, donation and uh, suggested a letter from the poor council and the board to recognize this donation uh, to the family uh, to be in order. So um, the uh, Marine Operations Group will be uh, getting that, that model back on board the vessel uh, shortly. So. That's a nice uh, gesture. Uh, and I guess, would there be some type of uh, plaque or acknowledgement yeah, that's associated ask, with yeah. it that you know would uh, identify uh, Mr. Whitmire as the and the family is the donor, the Mr. Whitmire is the modeler, and uh, something like that. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. We can add that added to the display case. Yes. Yeah, that would be that'd be excellent. I don't know if you need a any kind of a vote from the port council, but certainly I think we would be unanimous in our support for for this uh, accepting this wonderful donation and and providing the acknowledgement. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll draft up a a, a letter and just uh, to, to the family to uh, acknowledge the donation and the appreciation of the board council and the you know we'll bring it to the board's attention at their meeting next week. Thanks for doing that. At least from the image, it looks terrific. 
it's, it does. It is. It's very. It's very nice. Yeah. It's very accurate. Is there any other old or new business that the Port Council? If, uh, if I may, uh, Rob. Joe. Uh, two things. One is this is to, to Mark Higgins. What about our generator in uh, Oak Bluffs? It's been a couple of months now. That work is scheduled for after we close Oak Bluffs down. Okay. Uh, because of the time constraints of we'd actually have to turn power off for two separate periods for a number of hours. So we decided to delay that and do that after we close the terminal. All right. thank, thank you, Mark. The, the second thing that I have is, and I've been, got a few phone calls on this, is what happened with the fast ferry coming from New Bedford that the gate was up and the people had to wait about 15 or 20 minutes <laughs> before they could uh, get on dry land. So what happened was um, the agent on duty um, overslept because they were not feeling well, and they just it was just a, one of those I don't say comedy of errors, but unfortunately it was a situation where they were not feeling well, okay. overslept. So by the time the boat arrived at seven o'clock, the um, the agents in Virginia Haven were notified, sent over a dock worker right away with the key. And had the gate open by ten thirteen. I mean, sorry, seven thirteen. So well, yeah, that was the first day that the new schedule was in that the boat wouldn't be coming into Oak Bluffs until what nine thirty. Uh, first station. No. no, no, it was uh, the schedule changed on September sixth, so yeah. it would have been three days later. Yeah, this yeah. So unfortunately, someone was not feeling well. And... Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other old business. <laughs> I said enough, Mr. Chairman, today. Okay. Any new business? Uh, Eric. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment. This is this is really educational. And, you know, the, the reality is watching you guys and listening to the his, history of how things have worked and how they haven't worked and how you come together with your thoughts and ideas it's, it's a great education for me, and I, I just want to really tell everybody I appreciate their engagement and, and how they are able to just speak freely and, and engage in helping management out. This is, this is a really great system that is set up. And, Nate, I'm going to tell you, I, I really love listening to you. You, you can talk all day long. I, I can listen. I love logistics. So well yeah. done. So thanks. Thanks all. It's a good. It is good. This is a great um, group, um, has been since the, it started in 2002. Two, yeah. Two. There you yeah, go. I think that's what legislation was, yeah. Yep. So, so, thanks for your comment, so nice Eric. To and learn. So and nice we, to learn. we appreciate and look forward to your contributions, too. And and really what we try to do is have a opportunity for generative open discussions. And, uh, you know, it takes each of us to help make that happen. So thank you. Appreciate it. Is there uh, some public comment? Uh, if anyone has public comment, you can hit the raise your hand icon. And I yeah. see Mary Longacre. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add another perspective. I work for a software company and, and we connect different applications to each other. There is a huge difference. I want to make sure that the public listening and the um, members of the Port Council are aware. There's a huge difference in creating a system from scratch that is new, whether it's a reservation website, and creating a, a new version of a system or website that needs to meet public expectations of hundreds of thousands of people who use it. Um, I, I applaud the Steamship Authority for taking the time to track down all of the little things that aren't perfect and making sure they're fixed before this gets released to the public. I know it won't be perfect when the new website is released, um, but it. I understand from my position in a software company how much work it is to anticipate everything that could go wrong, to try and make sure that everything is going to flow smoothly, to make sure the information is not lost, to make sure that people's reservations are made in a way that they are comfortable with, and executed and delivered in uh, in good order, uh, it is a huge undertaking. And you know, in my experience in a software company, as this one of the gentlemen said, it never takes. Less. It's 
Um, so I'm looking forward to the launch. Uh, thank you for all the hard work and, and all the effort that you're making on behalf of the traveling public to make sure that their experience is a good one. Thank you for your comment, Mary. Uh, that's all I see, Mr. Veneer. Okay, I think we are at the moment where we can have a move uh, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Go here a second. Let's do a roll call. Joe. Aye. John. Aye. Eric. Eric Hayden via Homer, <laughs> Louisiana. Aye. <laughs> Matt. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Munir, aye. Thank you all. And we'll Thanks, everybody. Guys, good meeting. Good night. See you. Bye-bye.